Hey gang, um, so this is uh, the first one after Lucky 14, or Lucky 13 makes it number 14. We talked about nomenclature last time on um, ratchet systems, the accumulator, the cylinder, the trigger box. Basically you have it the push of a button, a way of opening and closing a valve, and I'll get into that with trigger boxes, either a two-way or two separate valves in opposites. Um, to force air into a cylinder, but this is your working part. This is what creates mechanical advantage, uh, force advantage um, for your pulling. Instead of you trying to use gravity with your body weight, you can calculate it. You reach a point where you can't get any quicker in time. People don't come, in drag racing, we always say come out of the hole. How fast you can go from zero, standing still, to moving. And um, that's a limited number. That's a very finite number when you're pulling a rope. I don't care what you're jumping off of. You can pull longer, you can pull faster, um, but you can't get any quicker than a certain amount because the fact is you're governed by gravity on the planet and you only fall so far so fast based on gravity. I don't care what you weigh, you know, it's the old feather versus a boulder in a vacuum. It's physics, guys. So if you really want to figure it out, you go to a machine, you can use it and it'll, it'll make things happen quicker. You have instantaneous force or millisecond delay, um, depending on your valves, and you can generate huge amounts of force. So this is a pneumatic air cylinder. This is known as a tie rod cylinder because it has billet end caps that are held by these long tie rods that are torqued to a certain value that cap the ends of the cylinder. You can have a welded closed cylinder similar to the one that's behind me that's the hydraulic cylinder used on my brake tester, which is good for 12 to 14 tons. Um, and that one can come apart. It's all welded together, but it has a face on the end with a, that you use a, a special wrench for, and you can disassemble it all through one side. Um, but those are heavy and they're steel and they're designed for super high pressures. These. Um, I have made for me in the States. I import them here. They're designed a bit different. Um, I, I have to take a moment and, and digress onto this whole carbon fiber cylinder bullshit. Um, this cylinder weighs 16 kilos. It is a meter 25 or known as a four foot cylinder. Today's discussion is going to bounce around between uh, imperial and metric. If you can't figure it out, you better learn because when you work worldwide, Half the bozos are on Imperial, half the bozos are on metric, and you should be able to interchange these units in your head. Um, so, you know, that's, that's up to you. I'm not even gonna bother, because today I'm gonna probably revert back to my Imperial roots, being from the States, and do a lot of this in PSI and pounds of force. Um, but, you know, you can always do the math in your head if you can't quite grasp it. Um, it, it doesn't matter, to me, it doesn't matter what the fucking units are. Um, it's the formula is applied to all units. So it's whatever unit you're comfortable with. It could be fucking biblical cubits for all I care. It doesn't really matter. It's just how things are, their interrelationships to one another in terms of force and pressures. Okay. So that's today. Um, <clears throat> carbon fiber ratchets. Um, there are those out there that jumped on the carbon fiber game. And as we've already shown with our fly bars, to get the equivalent strength of aluminum or aluminium, depending on where you're from again, um, the bars in a meter long length only weigh 100 grams difference. So for the security and, and feeling that I get from being able to ding, bang, fuck with aluminum, because um, it gets treated like shit on set, you know, everybody's in a hurry, shit gets dropped, etc. Versus the instant or non-visual ability to inspect carbon fiber, it has two modes. It's either perfectly good or it explodes. Um, it's great if you're a Formula One team, you're trying to save a kilo here, trying to save a, a pound there. It's great. It's why you have titanium bolts. It's why you have all that shit. And it's why it costs it exponentially more. Carbon fiber has come down in price, but you also have to look at, this is industrial equipment, kids. So this ram in carbon still has to have an inner liner of aluminum or you won't have a proper seal. You may get away with it with a nice gel coat on the fiber with the seals for a while. But once everything seats in, it's like a piston in your car, it's gonna rub in certain reasons, in certain areas due to the reason we use these the way we do. And it's gonna fuck up your seals inside, it's gonna fuck up your ram, and you'll wonder why it leaks like a little bitch. Um, 
because you've cut grooves in the walls. Um, you may not see them, you may not know, but it's now gradually, because the piston can move in the bore of this cylinder, gradually chewed out area that allows air past the, the seals. Um, so what they do now mostly is they use very thin alley, one mil wall, and then they'll carbon fiber wrap it. Okay, so now you have your seals, you put it in. For the cost, why bother? I mean, what is the point? If it's nine kilos, what it's done, does that make a difference to you versus 16 kilos because it's sitting on a fucking truss? It's not like you're running a race with these things. They're industrial equipment. I use tie rod cylinders for the simple reason I can disassemble them. I carry, unlike most people, I carry all the seal kits, the nose bushing kits. I carry everything to rebuild this at a moment's notice for every Ram times six. Okay, I have six ratchet setups. I have six complete setups. They all are exact duplicates of one another. Um, some are longer. Um, I have four at four foot or a meter and a quarter. And I have two at eight foot, which is two and a half meters. Um, depending on what I'm doing. Uh, the eight footers hardly see any use. Because of the mechanical force we can generate with these, uh, I hardly need to go any longer than, than this size. Um, so that's my thing. It's like, Sometimes simple is better. And I come from a racing world. I come from building fuel dragsters, uh, top fuel Harleys and shit. And uh, sometimes you just got to keep it simple. Sometimes simple is elegant. Uh, you can fix it. You got to think all this bespoke, as the English say, bespoke equipment is great. But what do you do when you got to re repair it? How do you repair it? Do you carry all the repair parts for it? You ding a cylinder in the ass of the world wherever you're shooting you better have others there to use, and you still have to get the shot, kids. So everything we design is designed to survive. It's all modular, so you can still get the shot. If your trigger box fucks up, you can go past it. If this fucks up, you've got a backup on it. That's how they're designed because, hey, guess what? Shit breaks all the time. And anybody who builds shit that tells you it doesn't break is, is, is full of shit. Okay, mechanical equipment breaks. You can treat it really wonderful and it'll reach, you don't know how many cycles, they cycle test these, you know, industrial. So you know that they've cycle tested the seals at X pressure for 100,000 cycles. Well, that tells me that since we don't shoot 100,000 ratchets, I mean, Angel, um, we did 300 in one week spread over six different ramps. Um, so that's, that's a fair amount of use. That's kind of the most I've ever used in one week. Um, that that's uh, rehearsals included, but generally you don't get that many times because you remember after your first five or six attempts and getting everything dialed with a bag, you're shooting a human and you have a limited number of times to shoot that human before you beat the shit out of them. Um, and normally you're mitigating that with doing a, a catcher on a line or not dropping them unless you have to see the ground shot. Da -da -da -da. There's ways around it. We won't bother. But the fact is, Industrial cylinders are designed for high cycles. So I have industrial cylinders that I can repair. I can be in India. I can be in fucking Antarctica if I need to, and I can fix this. Worst case, I can get in and try to pound out a dent if this gets dented. Um, I can disassemble it all with basic tools and having a spare part. So for me, sometimes simple is better. Um, I personally love carbon fiber. It's really cool. But unless you've got plenty of extra pieces, unless you're carrying all your spare parts, um, I mean, I have a racing trailer out there that's two floors of equipment. And most racers carry two floors of spare parts plus their cars. So it's full, it's 33 tons of stuff. Um, most people don't carry that, you know? So I carry all the parts needed to fix this. Unless you're prepared to do that, then stop using individual handmade one-off parts. And if you do, I have a lathe, a mill, I do everything here. You make five of them, you make eight of them, you make 10 of them, so you carry spares with you. Uh, it's a really quick lesson you learn when you're racing. You make that one super cool part and it works amazingly until it breaks. And then you have to replace it, so you better have more of that super cool part or else you better have the time to make it. And that doesn't happen on a race weekend where you come in on a Friday, you test and tune, you blow up a motor, you throw that one on the floor, you put another one in, and you keep going like that all weekend rebuilding shit as you go, but you have backups. So it's the same philosophy we use on this. Enough of that. All right, so here's a cylinder. Basically, Stunts uses an air cylinder in the fall in the wrong way. 
Air cylinders are designed to move a piston inside this bore back and forth. It's connected to a rod. In this case, it's a one inch steel rod. Some people will use cable and they love them and they can't really tell you why. Oh, it's so much easier. It's a, hey, it saves weight. Like I said, this is 16 kilos with a one inch steel rod that's four feet long. Do I give a shit? No. And the good part about the rod here is it gives me a firm anchor point. Um, I know what it is. I know what its strength is. I'm not, I, I'm able to inspect it. I can look at the bushings around it. I use this, period. It doesn't matter. But this is a cylinder. It pushes that rod in and out. It's a closed system. Right now there's end caps. Okay, let's, if you try to move this rod, it won't go anywhere because it's got suction on this side, dead air space, and it's got compression on this side, dead air space. It can't move. It's a sealed fucking system. Okay, this piston can only go somewhere if more air goes in one side than the other in any direction. Okay? Now I say as stunt people, we use these in the wrong fashion. Hydraulics, pneumatics, everything is based on a piston. So if something's attached to a piston, it's on one side. So that means you have the face on one side, which has a specific area. And then you have the face on the other side with the rod, which is the specific area minus the rod. Okay, or minus the cable or minus whatever's there. So it's less volume on one side than the other. Okay, so at the same pressure, if you're putting air into the, the rod or cable or whatever, the occupied side, you're going to have less force for given pressure than you will on the face. And that's one of the formulas behind me. So that's this formula, which is the force equals the pressure times the pi diameter squared over four. So your area, this is area, pi diameter squared. If you have a rod, that reduces your diameter because you have to internally subtract what's occupying space. So you have less area. So when you divide it, you have less. So an example, this is a four inch, 100 millimeter cylinder, okay? When you calculate, I won't bore you with it because you can look this up online now, you got calculators. I mean, when I did this 50 years ago, you had to know these formulas and you worked it all out on your calculators. Now you can just punch it in and it's pretty straightforward. On the rod side, if I put 100, whatever air pressure I put in here, PSI, let's call it PSI today. For every PSI I put in here, I'm going to get seven pounds of force because I'm putting it on the rod side, pulling the rod back into the body, okay? On the face side, if this was all the way back like it is now, and I put air into this side, on the open face side, for every PSI I put into this, I'm gonna get 12 pounds of force extending the ram. And that's due to the fact of the area differential on the piston on both sides, okay? So, we use them wrongly in only the retracting state. Pistons are designed to work in two directions and the strongest is to push it against the face. Less air pressure is required to achieve the same amount of work, okay? At 12, you're five pounds of force stronger for every given PSI in an ideal world than you are the other way. Why do we use it that way? Because it's easier to read. It's easier to do it that way. To push against something, you have to stabilize your rod. It requires very exact building of cages around the rams with the shivs so that everything's reeved so it doesn't bend the rod or fuck the cable up or whatever, okay? So that's why we do it this way. Disadvantage to this is, when this piston's all the way out, we're gonna take the caps off because otherwise we're gonna sit here and fuck around. Um, when you pull this rod all the way out, what you end up with is a weight or a mass hanging now this one's jammed in pretty heavy let me see if I can get it out of here do, 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 do. sorry I was fighting with this pulling it out and I figured you didn't want to watch that on film when they're all the way back with the seals and they've sat for a while they tend to stick in the position. So you can take this cylinder rod in and out of this truss, okay? By putting air in the front, front part of the cylinder, it will push the rod back, okay? By putting air into the back of the cylinder, it will push the rod out. Simple, the way they work. 
This is how they work. Okay? Now, it's a closed system. So, you can only put as much air into this as you can get out of it. Or else you're going to be compressing the air in here and slowing this piston down. Okay, so that's problem number one with using normal manufactured cylinders. The ports are designed to be throttled down. They use what's called an air cushion. So you'll have a large port that has a very tiny hole in the bottom because at the working portion of the stroke, at the beginning, it will flow okay. And then as the pressure builds, it will restrict it so it never really hammers one way or the other. We need these to work hard, fast, and stop abruptly. So air cushions don't work very well for us. The reason why we use these, this is probably one of the worst reasons these are a problem, is the longer this rod gets out here on the front, the more weight's on the piston length. So the piston is being pulled in the bore. Now, yes, you have bushings up here on the nose. They're bronze bushings, they're sealed. Okay, so that keeps that from happening, but basically, Extend a piece of metal, four feet, a meter and a quarter out, and hold it by the end, and you'll see the leverage factor that's on that. Okay, so what we end up doing a lot of the times is putting a trolley on the nose of these to support them, which helps obviate the, the, the problem of these. Um, what happens when the piston cocks in the bore, A, it requires more force to drive it back and forth, and B, a piston has rubber seals, but it wears because now the piston's not perfectly straight. Now this is, we're talking thousands here, folks. It's like the piston in your car, okay? It's easier for people to grasp. If it's not perfectly straight, it's wearing this way. It's gonna take out more of the, the bore. It's gonna, di sh diagonal shit in a, in, a, in a linear fashion doesn't work well. So what happens is over time, and it doesn't take long, these will groove themselves and you will see in the direction that it has been used, it will have it will start wearing a wear pattern inside these. When you take them apart and you shine a light, you can see the wear pattern at the top, back, and bottom front of the piston because it's doing this instead of being straight. I've designed them so they stay straight. I won't get into boring you, but that's why I have them made that way. I eliminate the air cushions. The important fact is when we use these, and this is where most people fail, it's like a bad spinal tap video. Turn it up to 11. Everybody thinks that adding more pressure is the end and be all of how these work. Wrong. You can overcome a lot of fucked up design with high pressure. The more pressure you use, the harder things move until they don't move anymore. So by shoving a ton of air in the nose of this, I can overcome how quickly it compresses because it can't exhaust. If I put all the caps in this, and seal this up when it's fully out, and I shoot 20 bar in the front of this thing, it's only gonna come a little way back until this is compressed at an equal compression as the pressure I've shot in the front because it can't exhaust it. You can't even pull them in and out by hand. So think of under pressure. So the fact is, it's a sealed system. You need to be able to get the air out of here at volume and speed the same as you put it in the other side, or else you're pissing up a rope. Because you'll reach a point very quickly where you, you're adding pressure and all you're doing is working the cylinder. All you're doing is compressing the load back here. So all that extra pressure is not achieving any work for the rod. All it's doing is, is compressing more air back here to get around your fucked up design. Now, this is a real problem for us in the fact that the higher the pressure, the more dangerous this device is, especially with people who don't grasp this. So they're like, oh, he didn't go fast enough. Eh? Remember I said you gotta separate fast and quick, two different things, one speed, one's time. Okay, so what do they do? Whack, add another fucking 100 PSI to it. Well, that's great, but you won't see, they wonder why they don't see any results. Why, why doesn't it change? Well. Because you've reached a point where you're only compressing the air in the back of the cylinder. So unless you can exhaust it, you can't put it in the front. Okay, so these are your limiting factors on a cylinder. All right, so for, for us, for my designs, for the way we operate, we have 
more exhaust than we have the ability to shove air in the front. Um, in the old days, when we first built these, we used to leave them completely open at the back, have tabs that we anchored the clevis with, and then they were just literally open with a small cage over the end, and the cylinder would, was open. So when you shoved air in the nose, it went all the way back, and there was no way to extend it. There was no exhausting. It was a full open cylinder at the end. Worked pretty cool. Had inherent problems with dirt collection, with shit getting in the cylinder. Um, the other problem was you couldn't use them for other things. They were simply a pulling device. It's kind of like having a rope on the back of your car and hitting the gas. That's all they could do. You couldn't use them in reverse by controlling the exhaust flow because um, there was un it was uncontrollable. So then we evolved to more porting. Anyway, we have more porting with no air cushions than we have the ability with no air cushions to shove air into this. So we have zero resistance as this is going back other than the friction of the seals on the inside walls. Hence, it's more efficient. More efficiency means it works at lower pressures, okay? A simple way of figuring this one out is take a hydraulic cylinder and try to drive it on air and everything is so tight and so heavy that it takes 100 PSI just to get the fucking piston to move, let alone quickly. So now suddenly you're going to be shoving air in and you're suddenly your hundreds, your baseline just to get around, for want of a better term, let's call it stiction because it sticks in place. Things that, it, it, things in, in, that don't move, don't like to move and they require more effort to get them moving. Okay, that's, that's physics. Objects in motion stay in motion, objects at rest stay at rest. Okay, so that initial force required to move that piston is always higher than what it takes to keep it moving. The same with your performer. They're fixed, they're in inert, or worst case, they're running into it, and it takes more power to get them <laughs> airborne and flying than it does to keep them so. So you need more pressure for a shorter distance to get them flying. Now, the problem gets to be when you jack the pressure up and you've kept the stroke length the same, all of a sudden, they, you've overcome their initial resistance and now they're fucking skying to Mars. <clears throat> We've all seen the shitty YouTube videos of people and watching stunt guys go faster than the speed of sound and you know, they're, they're all over the internet of fuck ups with these things. Um, so this is the dance you play. Um, now let's get into simple thing, the volume of a cylinder. Okay, this is where you have to calculate how much air you need to put in this thing. Pi, your good old 3.14159 times the radius, which is half the diameter of this squared, times the overall length. Now, in geometry, it'll say height, but if I stand this on end, then that's height. So I just call it the length, because it's the length of the cylinder. Now, this is important, as we mentioned earlier, because you have your accumulator, which you know, because we talked about nomenclature. If you need to fill this, you better have more air in your accumulator than goes into this, so you do not have a pressure drop as it progresses. In other words, if this is 10 liters, which it's not quite, and you have a 10 liter accumulator, you will push this to its end stroke, if that's what you're trying to do, but you will lose pressure in the last bit because it's an equal amount of air, okay? That's, a, that, that's if they're equal. Now, if it's slightly less air in there in the cylinder, you will then push it, and because air expands, it will push this to the end, but it will have absolutely no force, no movement. It will become an air spring because if you add more weight, or here's the thing, you get somebody to fly up, and then they fall down and you watch the ram go boing as a big air spring because it's compressing this because it's not at the pressure you set on the accumulator. It's now at the pressure that it has become in this new container. Okay? So these are all things to think about and most people don't. They don't even want to know. Um, but that's why your accumulator has to be slightly oversized for what's in this cylinder. Okay? Um, that's your other thing. Now, in the terms of how we perceive the use of these, um, as I said, there's time and there's speed. Um, generally, 
If you're jumping off a ladder, you're jumping on a count one beat before the actual mark because you have to get up to get enough snap to come down to make anything like a reaction because generally you're going to have some 85 kilo stunt guy and you're only 90 kilos or maybe you're a big boy, 100, 110 kilo, but it, you only fall so fast, period. If I put two people out there, it doesn't matter who's heavier and I drop them both off a building, they're both going to fall at the same rate of speed. It goes back to your physics. If you need to do this, get out an old high school physics book and it's pretty simple. It'll explain it all. Um, so here's the reality. How do you get that suddenness? How do you get that quickness? With a device. Now, if it's one to one, meaning this rope pulls directly to the performer, every centimeter, every inch, every foot, every meter that this cylinder pulls, the same distance of rope is pulled, it takes X amount of time for that to react, depending on the pressure, okay? So, how can you make it seem quicker in units time? We reverse Reeve it so that it's one to two, disadvantage. So for every distance we pull on the cylinder, we're pulling twice the amount of rope, okay? That usually involves coming from your performer around the shiv, which is fit into the clevis of the ram, okay? And then dead it off. Um, we typically use a clutch, so we'd come up here, go through another pulley, and into a clutch. That way you can also adjust it, but it doesn't matter for this example, just it's deadheaded there, comes through this shiv, and goes out to your performer. Now we are at a disadvantage one to two. If you tried that jumping on a rope, you'd get absolutely nowhere, unless you've got a 40 kilo performer, and it because their weight's doubled. The force has got to be double. Um, with a machine, we don't care. I mean, this is good for 1,000 PSI. This is good for 64 bar. Um, so if I want something to happen right now, I just turn it up. Um, so that gives us the ability to create and play with quickness. It doesn't have to travel any farther. It doesn't have to go any faster. It's the suddenness with which you can overcome the inertia of a static body, your performer. So that's part of the reason for using these the way we do. And usually I always read these one to two disadvantage um, because they, they look much quicker and snappier. And you don't have to because it's happening in time frame so quickly. You don't have to go the higher in pressures down the road to get a better looking result. Um, when something happens slow over a distance, you can actually be accelerating the whole way, and at the end, they're going much faster than a sudden movement here where they're actually just maintaining and decelerating speed. But in that initial acceleration phase is much quicker, much faster, the acceleration. They both will achieve the same speed or possibly less speed for the reverse because it doesn't need to go that hard to the end and it's much safer for your performer. So now you're not beating the shit out of your performers. You're not pulling them inside out. Remember, it's a bag of jello on the end of that line, okay? You don't wanna be hitting them with f four, five, six cheese repeatedly, okay? Um, and look at the math, folks. At seven pounds on the rod side, because we use them backwards for every PSI, at 100 pounds of pressure on the rod side, you're exerting 700 pounds of instantaneous, relatively 50, 60, 80, 100 milliseconds, depends on the balance you have, to your performer. They're gonna move in a fucking hurry. Now, if that's on a one-to-one, -one, they move at this rate. If that's two-to-one, they double, or one-to-two, excuse me, they double the distance they travel in that time. So it's much more sudden, it's much more vile or violent looking. It's, it's, it, it, it's a huge difference. And with that, you can come down in the pressures because you're not trying to take them out at 100 miles an hour. You just need that acceleration at the beginning. That's why on a hand pull, you can 
you can fly them a long way. You can jump off fucking top of a truss 20 meters in the air. It doesn't matter. You will get them out of the hole and you will fly them at a certain speed that whole distance. But it's not going to help for that initial hit. And that's why we do what we do. Um, last thing, I'll go over a couple things. One, the support here, we design our rams. So these will fit, we use rocks. We also have simple carriages that go around the clevis because I don't want any more weight up here than I have to. Um, and when you put your clevis on, your clevis goes into this device and then it is screwed onto the clevis threads. And you have a very nice nose support, which ours are set so you can vary them a bit. You have a nice nose support on the end of your rim. So this can move in and out. It's supported. It's always on center line. You're never going to bend this. This will hold either singles or doubles on the rock. It's designed to be able to be the same center lines. And with a double, I can go three to one, four to one. Um, we also have other heads we make because we use these to desell. These will hold three single or double rocks. So with our end plates down here, which you've already seen before in the, the base, base setup, we can go 12 to one on these. Well, just a little, a little note here, 12 to one. You wonder why these go to 64 bar. 12 to one, okay, when you calculate force on a working line, if you have a one to one, so this is at 100 PSI, and your line is pulling at 700 pounds of force. Okay, at one to two, because one line is dead, one line is working, so you split the force over two working lines, you now at half that force. So you're at 350 pounds of force. It's amazing, your performer will look like he's flying harder and faster, but it's just because it's happening in a quicker time frame, and it's happening with half the amount of pressure. Now, if you start going up to four, five, six to one in reverse, well, suddenly your, your pull is, keeps dropping if you keep fixed pressure, so you need to keep adding pressure, adding pressure. Hence, these can go up to 12 to one. Um, that's how I look at this system is because it's utterly interchangeable. Um, but when you calculate force on your performer, you have to look at your working parts of line and calculate accordingly. So you can actually calculate, I'm using this pressure, I'm at one to two, my working line is only seeing, so you can say at 100 PSI in this four inch four cylinder, working on the rod side, I'm at seven pounds of force, so that's 700. One to two disadvantage means I'm seeing half of that force on my performer. That is now 350 pounds of force on my performer, okay? On your stroke, if you want to pull him one meter, you would only be moving this piston 50 centimeters, okay? So two feet, you're only gonna go two feet because you're gonna end up with four foot of travel. It's one to two in reverse. These are all the math calculations you gotta think of when using these things. This is the setup involved. This is how it works. So this is why a lot of people just don't even bother. Um, but they're a very useful tool. And um, yeah, we. one other thing, one other pet peeve, people lock these things down. I've seen straps on the front of them. I've seen, dude, it's the worst thing you could possibly do. It's a great way to bend a rod, blow a ram, fuck everything up. This system, I notice I have my rear plate on it, is designed for everything to run level on center line. Again, back to our truss wrap earlier in our base stations. Everything I own is set on five mil aluminum plate. I don't need to support the back of the ramp because nobody cares. It's pinned at center line. It's, this was set up based on if this was on both sides. I don't need to have an aluminum plate back here. The nose is level with the tail, it's pinned. The wheels, if, they, if, if this rod had any downforce on it, are able to run on this alley plate. The rod is always supported, okay? So everything runs on center line. The center line of this device is lined up with the center line of my pulleys up front. So it's always in center line, whether it's on a two to one, a one to two, a one to four, whatever, okay? 
Everything is built on center lines. That's why we use the same pulleys, we use the same everything, and it's all based on the center lines, okay? That's part of it, because you avoid all of the parasite friction of trying to overcome either a bad alignment, not enough exhaust, and you, what does everybody do? Turn it up, turn it up, because they don't fucking know, so what's their answer? Turn it up, it's like Spinal Tap, turn it up to 11. You're gonna fucking hurt people horribly doing this. That's why you got to know your math before you use mechanics. Mechanical rigging, um, we have many safeguards built into the trigger boxes, but the point is when it comes to go time, if you've done your calculations, you will fuck your equipment and or slash your performer brutally. And this is not what we're trying to do. So here's the wrap on cylinders, formulas to look up, force, Pressure times pi times the diameter squared over four. Um, yeah, and there's your volume of the cylinder for your calculations on how big an accumulator you need. Um, if these numbers aren't big enough, you can always go bigger. Okay, you can get a bigger cylinder. You can go five inch, six inch, seven inch, eight inch. The effects guys use 12 inch cylinders, 10 foot stroke, 10 to 1 in reverse, so 1 to 10, and they throw cars hundreds of meters through the air, okay, with 200, 300 bar. So you, you can, this extrapolates quite well to all that. Um, the last thing I will mention is, in using cylinders, cylinder theory for us, it's a hot rod theory. The more air you can shove in this cylinder in the shortest possible time, meaning flow, the better you're going to be. The more reaction you have, the more force you have, the more the quicker it all happens. So for all of that to work, it's like an intake on a race car or, or when you turbo or supercharge. So airflow, it's all about airflow. So you gotta get air out, you gotta get air in. So there becomes a way to do that and you have to follow the laws that govern these things. It's fluid dynamics, guys. It's air theory. It's just why, why guys hot rod engines and got guys who are magical at porting the intakes on engines. Same thing here. You gotta be able to get it in and get it out or you're pissing up a rope. So this is a cylinder. It's a mechanical tool to create force advantage so we can achieve things that we normally wouldn't be able to do in time frames that make it look quite, quite violent. And with the use of the low pressures that we are operating on this system at. Um, I relatively never see more than 10 bar, which is 150 PSI on a one to two. So I'm seeing 400 pounds of force max on a performer. So, you know, that's like watching somebody get tackled by a dude running down the, the fucking football field. Um, there's more violent tackles than that. So you've now mitigated a lot of the danger factor. You're not gonna hurt people. Um, remember, it's five bucks in a bo box of popcorn at the end of the day, kids. So use these correctly. This is the beginning of cylinder theory. Um, you can get into this big time, deep, 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 um, which I have and I won't bore you with. So that's going to wrap up. Let me find my on and off gizmo. And that's going to wrap up with cylinders for today. It's about air in, air out, flow, and force. Okay, and you calculate everything. You know this ahead of time. Okay, before you even set these up, you should know this shit like inside now. Okay, all right, take care.